I hope in harmony with Dabney's suggestion a while ago that you fellows will feel free to take off your coats. I may have to shed mine before this is finished. It's a bit warm in here tonight. Frankly, I'm happy to engage in this kind of discomfort. When you have this many people together, the air conditioning likely will not be sufficient. I've enjoyed being here during the weekend. I'm grateful for Mrs. Mason, who was baptized into Christ this afternoon, for the two who responded to the invitation this morning for restoration. And it's my hope, desire, and prayer that tonight others will come to do the will of Jesus. It's good to be with Cal again. He and I were in graduate school together 20 years ago. And Bill, who will be leading the closing prayer, and I have been friends for several years. And there are the gospel preachers in the audience whom I have failed to see or I do not recognize from my vantage point. It's always a real, real pleasure for me to be with Dabney Phillips. I love him dearly. I think he's one of the finest men I've ever known. I think it can honestly be said of him that he is a man in whom there is no guile. Now, as far as the Dabneyisms are concerned, it's true that I do chuckle at those because no one else will. <laughs> and I thought, well, you know, I wouldn't want to leave my brother high and dry. So there, Don is a great song leader, but he needs to correct one thing. When he holds up the fingers like that for that second stanza, I don't know about you folk over here, but now back home, that's a danger signal. <laughs> that's hook em horns. And those of us in Arkansas don't take kindly to that at all. <laughs> so uh, maybe it's, well, I don't know. That's peace. Maybe I'll, sh no, that'd be third stand. Well, anyhow, work on something else. Tonight, I'm going to discuss with you a sermon that I have preached on many an occasion. It's one that I put on the shelf for a while and decided it might be better not to use it. And I guess one of the reasons was I received a great deal of criticism for preaching it. I do believe it's the truth. I think it's something for us to think about, but I wouldn't want a steady diet of it. And let me say before reading the text, this passage is not presented tonight in an attempt to frighten children. And it's not going to be discussed tonight because I believe the fundamental emphasis of the Christian religion is one of fear. But it is a topic that we need to consider some. The passage that I'll be reading and from which I will be working is Luke 16, 19 to 31. There was a certain rich man which was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus which was laid at his gate full of sores and desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. And in Hades he lifted up his eyes, being in torments, and seeth Abraham afar off with Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus, that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime receivest thy good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things. But now he is comforted, and thou art tormented. And beside all this, between us and you there is a great gulf fixed, so that they which would pass from hence to you cannot. Neither can they pass to us, it would come from thence. Then he said, I pray thee therefore, Father, that thou would send him to my father's house. For I have five brethren, that he may testify unto them, lest they also come into this place of torment. Abraham saith unto him, They have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. And he said, Nay, Father Abraham, but if one went unto them from the dead, they will repent. And he said unto him, If they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. According to that passage, two men lived and those two men died. And in the next life, the condition of those two men was exactly the opposite to what it had been in this life. The rich man on earth became the poor man in hell. The poor man here became the rich man in paradise. The rich man here was clothed in purple and fine linen, but in the next life he was robed in a garment of fire. The poor man here was attended by the dogs, but in the next life his soul was borne away by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man here fared sumptuously every day. But in the next life, he couldn't get a drop of water to cool his tormented tongue. The poor man here suffered his evil things, but in the next life, he was comforted. In this presentation tonight, I'll have time to raise and answer only one question. Namely, what is hell like? And let me say before beginning to answer that question, I will make no distinction between hell and the waiting place for the unrighteous dead. I believe the only difference between the two is the latter is limited to time whereas the former is not, not. 
in this presentation no distinction will be made between the two. What then is hell like? First I submit to you that it is eternal. In Matthew 25, 46 Jesus said, and these shall go away into everlasting punishment but the righteous into life eternal. In Romans 16, 26 Paul spoke of the everlasting God. At Hebrews 9, 14 there is a reference to the eternal spirit. We have before us four expressions to be considered. They are everlasting punishment, eternal life, everlasting God, and eternal spirit. The only difference between the words everlasting and eternal is a difference in spelling. They mean exactly the same thing. However, in each of these four instances, it is a form of the same Greek word which is translated as everlasting or eternal. And that word is ionios. Ionios means without end never to cease, everlasting or indeterminate as to duration. What the word means when it modifies hell punish, hell's punishment, it also means when it modifies heaven's bliss. If hell, for example, is to last for only a hundred years, then heaven is to last for only a hundred years. If the disobedient are to be punished for only a hundred years, then the obedient are to be blessed for only a hundred years. The very moment the disobedient cease to be punished, the righteous will cease to be blessed, God the Father and God the Holy Spirit will also go out of existence. For the word that modifies the one modifies all four. I insist that when the Bible says people will go away into everlasting punishment, it means precisely that. There are some who say, now Jim, this makes hell just too ugly. Well, if hell is too ugly, then heaven is too beautiful. And if hell is to be rejected because it's too something or the other, then heaven would have to be rejected because it's too something or the other. You see, it's the opposite on the one hand to what hell is on the other. Another will say, well, hell is too horrible. If hell is too horrible, then heaven is too wonderful. And if hell is to be excluded because it's too something or the other, then heaven would have to be excluded because it is also too something or the other. And then there are those who say, well, hell is too long. It wouldn't be right to take a man who's lived five years in disobedience and punish him eternally. If that argument has any validity, it then would not be right to take one who has lived five years in obedience and bless him eternally. And if not, why not? Those who argue that everlasting punishment is too long may not recognize it, but they're taking a slap at every system of justice known in the world. How do you determine the enormity and the heinousness of an act? By the amount of time it takes to do it or by the act itself? If I had a hand grenade and pulled its pin, I could pitch it into the audience and kill 20 people in 15 seconds. Suppose I were to do that, how much time should I spend in the penitentiary? It took only 15 seconds to kill the people. Would the demands of justice be satisfied if I spent 15 seconds behind bars? How about 30 seconds? How about 45 seconds? How about a half day? Would that be enough time for me to be incarcerated if I killed 15 people, beg your pardon, 20 people here tonight? All of us know if I were able to escape execution, I would spend the rest of my natural life behind bars for doing something it didn't take but 15 seconds to perform. How do you determine the enormity of a deed? By the amount of time it takes to do it or by the deed itself? Obviously by the deed itself. And one who lives five years, five months, five weeks, or five days in rebellion to the will of God and dies in that condition will be punished eternally. There are some who say, Jim, you're right in your definition of the word everlasting, but you have misunderstood the word punishment. These good people maintain that when one dies, he is annihilated. He goes back to where Adam was before he was created. Where was Adam before he was created? He wasn't. And so if when we die, we go back to where Adam was before he was created, then we are annihilated. We, are be we become in, uh, extinct. We are non-entity. So these good people maintain that in death we cease to exist. They say when the Lord comes again, the disobedient will be raised. They'll stand before God, be weighed in the balances and found wanting. Those folk then will be cast into the fire, at which time they will be instantaneously burned up. And so when the Bible speaks of a second death, they understand this to be a second annihilation. You die once and you're annihilated. You die the second time and you're annihilated. You cease to exist. They sometimes illustrate this point with a dog. They say when a dog dies, he is dead forever. And they maintain that when the disobedient are cast into the lake of fire, they're burned up and thus dead forever. Hence, when the Bible speaks of everlasting punishment, it means everlasting annihilation. 
or everlasting non-consciousness. I wanted you to see that point of view in all of its power and in all of its force. Really, there's only one thing wrong with it. It's not correct. It's not true. And I'm going to do my dead level best to point that out. Matthew 25, 46 says, And these shall go away into everlasting punishment. The word for punishment in the original language is colossum. At 1 John 3 and 18, it is translated as torment. Fear hath torment. In Luke 16, a moment ago, we read that the rich man lifted up his eyes, being in torment. He asked for a drop of water to cool his tormented tongue. He wanted his three brothers warned, lest they join him in that place of torment. Abraham said he was tormented, whereas the poor man was comforted. According to Revelation 14, 11, and 12, the smoke of their torment ascendeth up day and night forever and ever. Revelation 20 and 10, and they shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. Six times from the word of the Lord, we have learned that in the next life, the disobedient will undergo anguish or torment. I was reared in the country, and we sometimes tormented dogs. We'd put a string of cans on a dog's tail and watch him run. Once in a while, an individual put a little high life on a dog's back and then see him move on. Now, let's suppose we're dealing with a dead dog. Let's put a string of cans on his tail. Let's put a string on each ear and on all four paws. Let's drench him in high life. You're not, not harming the dog. He's unconscious. And where there is no consciousness, there can be no anguish. There can be no torment. But these people, according to Matthew 25, 46, go away into everlasting punishment. The word for punishment means torment. It means anguish. We have seen anguish or torment used six times to describe their condition in the next life. Then it is necessarily implied that these people are conscious. And the import of Matthew 25, 46 is these shall go away into everlasting conscious suffering torment. And that's what hell is like. But in the second place, it is described as a condition of darkness. In 2 Peter 2, 4, the writer said, God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down into hell and delivered them into change of darkness to be reserved unto judgment. Jude verse 13, the writer was referring to the false teachers and he said, to whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. In Matthew 25, 30, our Lord was describing the punishment of the one talent man and he said he's to be cast into outer darkness. First of all, darkness. Secondly, the blackness of darkness. And finally, outer darkness. It seems as though the figure intensifies itself. And when you speak of outer darkness, that suggests the point farthest removed from the source of light. Why in the world would the lot of the lost be described as one of darkness? Well, I want to try to answer. John said, God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. James said, he is the father of lights. According to Psalms 139, David said, If I ascend into heaven, thou art there. If I make my bed in Sheol, thou art there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost part of the sea, even there thy hand shall lead me. If I attempt to hide under the cover of darkness, you see me there. David was saying there is simply no way to get away from God. That God is omnipresent. Wherever you go, the Lord is there too. And yet the Bible tells us there is one place where God is not. In 2 Thessalonians 1, Paul said, Do you who are troubled rest with us when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance upon them that know not God and obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. Paul affirmed in those words that people who are lost will be away from the presence of the Lord. Since God is the Father of lights, where God is not would have to be a condition of perpetual darkness. Anything that I say from here on will be anticlimactic. I think you have described hell in the most horrifying terms known to man. When you say it is a condition where God is not, away from God, you say tonight if you're not a Christian, well, it isn't so bad being unsaved. But you say that because you live in God's world. You breathe God's air. You drink God's water. You eat God's food. You enjoy God's sunshine. But hell is described as a condition totally and completely removed from every trace, from every vestige of the presence of God and a godless situation. 
is far more horrible than any of us can imagine. Where God isn't, that's darkness. Perpetual darkness. I've sometimes thought we have an innate fear of darkness. When our three children were little, each one of them wanted a light on in the room when he or she went to sleep at night. I grew up in the country. I lived seven miles from the schoolhouse. A lot of times, I would be late in some school function, or maybe I would be on a date, and the last bus ran north toward my place at 9.38 in the evening, and I wasn't ready to catch the bus. So that meant I had to start riding my thumb. Generally, I had good luck. I'd catch a ride. I've walked every step of that seven miles. It didn't make any difference what kind of luck I had. I always had to walk the last mile and a quarter because it was that distance from the highway to my house. And I went through the darkest, densest creek bottoms you've ever laid eyes on. Now listen, I wasn't afraid, but I had a hard time convincing my feet of that. And I didn't run, but I walked a whole lot faster than normal. I never thought about running through those bottoms in the daylight. But at night, it was something else. You say, why did you run? Because it was dark. Do you need any other explanation? I can imagine there was an eight-headed monster out there about to devour me because it was dark. Oh, but that's just a teenager. Why is it harder to suffer through the long hours of the night than in the daylight? Let me tell you, friends, I don't want to go anywhere, which is always dark. That's enough to convince me I want to be saved. I do not want to be lost. I certainly don't want to lose the fellowship of God. And I don't want to leave in that, live in that condition of darkness. But thirdly, hell is described by the word fire. In Matthew 3, 11 and 12, baptism of fire. In Matthew 13, verse 42, the furnace of fire. In Matthew 25, 41, everlasting fire. In Revelation 20 and 10, fire and brimstone. Revelation 20, verse 15, lake of fire. Mark 9, 44, 45, the fire is not quenched. Over and over again, you have the word fire used to describe hell. But immediately that presents a problem. How can you have fire and darkness in the same place at the same time? You go outside this evening and build a fire and it will illuminate. It will dispel the darkness. It will give light. How could you have a condition of darkness and a condition of fire simultaneously? There are two possible ways to explain it. According to Exodus 3, Moses was tending his sheep near Mount Horeb one day, and he saw a bush burning, but it was not being consumed. And when he went nearby, God told him to take off his shoes for the place whereon he stood was holy ground. Now, there are two ways to explain the miracle of the burning bush. It may be that God performed a miracle on the bush so it wouldn't be consumed. Or it may be that God performed a miraculous fire which would not devour. Now, if the latter is correct, God could perform a miracle on that occasion by preparing a special fire. Then he could prepare a, a miracle by preparing a special fire in eternity to accomplish his purposes. But after having said that, let me add, I don't believe that's the correct explanation. Here's the problem. God is an infinite God, and you and I are finite people, and in the Word he is attempting to describe to us infinite existences. Now, how does an infinite God describe an infinite existence to finite people. How in the world is that going to be done? Do you think when you get to heaven that you will see literal gates of pearl, streets of gold, walls of jasper? Now what in the world could pearl and gold and jasper mean to spiritual beings on the other side? That was John's way of saying that heaven is far more wonderful than anything we can conceive. I don't believe there's an actual, literal description of either heaven or hell in the Bible. And when you are attempting to describe something to people which is outside their experience, of which they have absolutely no knowledge, you must use analogy. You must reason from the known to the unknown. You have to use metaphorical language. A simile is when you have a comparison and you use the words like or as. A metaphor is when a likeness is set forth as a reality. You might say he's a bull of a man. Well, now that's a likeness. He's like a bull. You might say she's an angel. That's a likeness. That's a comparison. You mean she's like an angel. Jesus said, I am the door. Well, he meant he was like a door. He said, I am the vine. He meant he was like a vine. He said, I am bread. He meant he was like bread. 
He referred to Herod Antipas as a fox. He meant he was cunning, treacherous, and wily. All of those are metaphorical expressions. And when the Lord is talking about punishment, he uses metaphor in order to describe such punishment. My son Mike has never seen the Empire State Building. And I might say to him, well, Mike, it's like a telephone pole. Well, is the Empire State Building like a telephone pole? Well, sort of. It's tall and slender. Now, he's never been on a subway. I might say, uh, well, it's sort of like that mole tunnel in the backyard. Well, is a subway like a mole tunnel? Well, a little bit, you know. You're in a better position to understand a subway if you liken it to a, a mole tunnel. Suppose you were talking to someone who died in 1860, and you were attempting to describe to that individual a 747 jet. To what would you liken it? Well, you'd have to use a bird. You mean to tell me a 747 is like a sparrow? Well, I don't, what else would you use? Bird's the only thing I'd know to use. Now, when you must use analogy, when you must use comparison, the thing itself is always greater than the analogy. It's always greater than the comparison. The Empire State Building is bigger than a telephone pole. The subway is far greater than the Moles Tunnel. And that 747 jet is greater than a sparrow. So when you read in the Bible where the word, or where hell is described by the word fire, that doesn't lessen it, friends. If anything, it makes it worse. The late great Black evangelist Marshall Keeble recognized this. He said, you can take an individual out of hell and put him in the hottest fire men could make, and in 30 seconds, he'd freeze to death. His point is there's simply no way to compare the punishment of the wicked in the next life with even a fire we could make here. I've said over and over again, if hell were just one-tenth as bad as its biblical description, that's enough to convince me I don't want to go. But the truth of the matter is, it's a hundred times worse. The most excruciating hurt you and I can experience is that of a burn. In Revelation 14, 11, and 12, the Bible speaks of the smoke of their torment going up day and night forever and ever. When you think of fire, you think of smoke. And that's simply a completion of the figure. And what the Bible is teaching is to be away from God is like burning. To be away from his fellowship, to not enjoy his company, is like burning. If you want to know what it's like, strike a match tonight and hold your finger in its flame for 30 seconds. Or when you get home, turn the oven up to about 400 degrees, let it burn a while, and then put your hands inside. Or the next time you go on a camping trip, let that campfire burn down real low, and then you push your hands just as close to the coals as you can without pulling them back. That's what hell is like. And that's why Jesus, over and over again, in his language, not mine, his, spoke of this weeping and gnashing of teeth. Suppose someone were to literalize that language. Now, this sounds foolish, but I'm trying to show the folly of literalizing language to describe heaven and hell. Suppose one literalized that language, gnashing of teeth. Well, the way to get an insurance policy is just take my teeth out. Obviously, one must have teeth in order to gnash them. If I don't have any teeth, I can't be lost. Why, who would do that? Weeping and gnashing of teeth means that when people undergo great pain, they cry and they grit their teeth. When they undergo severe and intense pain, they just grit those teeth to try to be able to stand it. And that's what it's like. To be alienated from God Almighty forever is to undergo great, severe, and intense pain. Yes, it's similar to burning. There will be no rest in hell. I've cited Revelation 14 twice, which speaks of the smoke of their torment ascendeth up day and night forever and ever, and they shall have no rest. Well, obviously they can have no rest. How could you rest when you're tormented? You couldn't. After a hard day on the road or a hard day at the office, it surely is wonderful to go home, sit in my big easy chair, take off my shoes and prop my feet up on the footstool and just unroll. Or better yet, walk into the bedroom and just fall across a bed and sink into the oblivion of sleep. But how horrible to be perpetually exhausted and to have no occasion and no opportunity for rest. There will be no rest in hell. There will be no relief in hell. The rich man wanted a drop of water to cool his tormented tongue. But he didn't get it. He didn't have to go there. He could have stayed out. But once he arrived there, he could not get any relief. 
During the latter part of the 19th century, one of America's best, best known atheists was named Robert Ingersoll. He lectured the length and the breadth of this country on the mistakes of Moses. I'm looking forward to hearing Moses lecture on the mistakes of Ingersoll. He died and all of his speeches were put together. And the name of the book is The Mistakes of Moses. I have the book. And one night I was reading from it and he was referring to Luke 16 about the rich man wanting a drop of water. And he said he would have given him some water. And I thought, Colonel Ingersoll, you have conveniently overlooked one fact. The man didn't have to be there. He could have received 10 million gallons of the waters of God's salvation in this life. But he neglected all of his opportunities and died lost. And there's not going to be any relief in the next life for the lost. There is no hope in hell. According to Matthew 25, 46, he shall go away into everlasting punishment. How long is everlasting? There are two words that send me into a theological spin. One is God. Without beginning of days or end of life, in whom we live, move, and have our being, one before whom we'll stand and give an account for the way we've lived. God. I can't comprehend God. I can't even begin to comprehend. I can't even start to commence to begin to comprehend God. That's one word, and the other one is eternity. How long is eternity? Those of us who preach can't even talk about eternity sensibly. We speak of a man spending eternity. You can spend a dollar, but you can't spend eternity. If you can, that argues it has an end. Or we say one lives throughout eternity. You can live throughout a decade. You can live throughout a century. You can live throughout a lifetime. You can't live throughout eternity. If you could, again, that would imply that it has an end. Just how long is eternity? If everything in this building were made of wood, how long would it take one termite to eat it? If everything in this community were made of wood, how long would it take him to eat Montgomery? Everything in the county is made of wood, how long to eat the county? Everything in the state's made of wood, how long to eat the state? Everything in America made of wood, how long to eat the nation? Everything in the world made of wood, how long to eat the world? Suppose the celestial bodies, Uranus and Jupiter and Neptune and Mars and all of these others were made of wood, how long would it take him to eat them? I don't know. But when he had finished that phenomenal job of eating all of the planets, that wouldn't be eternity. Suppose our world were made of steel. And suppose an ant were placed on the equator traveling at the rapid rate of one twelfth of a mile an hour. How long would it take an ant walking around a solid steel ball 25,000 miles in circumference to wear down a pass six inches deep? I don't know. How long would it take him to wear it in half? I don't know. Well, that wouldn't be eternity. Suppose you had one of these big oil tankers, 50,000 tons displacement and you were to fill its hold with English peas and then began to sail the seven seas at 25 knots an hour. And every 10,000 miles you throw a pea over the side. How long would it take to empty it? I don't know. But that wouldn't be eternity. That would be less than eternity. I've said if hell were only 100 years, I could stand it. Because after a day, I'd say just 99 years, 364 more days, and I'm going to get out. If it were 1,000 years, I could endure it. After a day, I could say just 999 years, 364 more days, and I'll get out. If it were only a million years, I believe I could endure that. After a couple of days, I could say just 999,999 years, 363 more days, and I'll get out. That faint glimmering ray of hope down at the end of the way would cause me to hold on. But the truth of the matter is, once an individual has been in this condition for a million years, he has no less time to spend. None at all. Donny, the famous Italian poet in his poem on the Inferno, suggested the sign hanging over hell, Hell's Gate should read, Those who enter this way leave all hope behind. And if we die unprepared to meet God, we go into a hopeless and a helpless and a helpless situation forever. Is anyone died unsaved in the last six months whom you knew? You've been to the cemetery? You stood by the grave? What happened to that person? Do you feel any remorse? Do you feel any guilt? Do you feel badly at all because you never did tell him the gospel? Never did share the good news of Jesus? Never gave him or her an opportunity to yield to Christ and obey the gospel? You know anyone that's departed in the last six months? We all do. Now I remember a boy with whom I grew up. He was just as mean and wicked and ungodly as a king. And while I was away in the service, he was killed in the less time that it takes me to describe it. And he's buried near where my mother is buried. 
As a matter of fact, I don't get to my mother's grave without going past his. And he was a good-looking rascal. And they have his handsome facial features in that tombstone. And many a time I have stood by his grave and almost trembled. I thought that could have been me. Because the day he was killed, I was lost too. And I'm so grateful I was spared and finally came to my senses. But it's enough to make you tremble. The man's been gone for 30 years. Died without any hope. If he can go to heaven, we might as, all, might as well all quit preaching, all quit teaching. Let's cease our mission activities. I'm telling you, if there's a hell, he's in it. A hopeless condition. He did everything he was big enough to do. He thought it was smart to be wicked. He's learning the hard way. That isn't the case. Hell is a place where one retains his mental faculties. The rich man could feel he was tormented. He could see. He could talk. He could hear. And he could remember. Abraham said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime receivest thy good things, likewise thou hast evil things. He remembered his five brothers. And if he could remember his former life, if he could remember his five brothers who were still living, I maintain he could remember all of the opportunities he had neglected. I think one of the horrors of being lost will be remembrance. If I had listened to my good Christian wife, if I had paid attention to the disciple who came to my home, if I had listened to Dabney, if I had paid heed to Jimmy during the meeting in June, if if, 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 one of the smallest words in the English language, and yet from another's perspective, one of the biggest. In 1941, my mother and five other people were in a new Ford driven up on the railroad tracks in front of the Rock Island Rocket, a streamlined train. My mother saw the train coming. She knew what was about to take place. She said, oh my, there's a train. She opened the door and was about half in and half out when the train struck the rear of the automobile pitched it over into a rather deep depression, and she was under it. Of the six people in that vehicle, she was the only one killed. Had she been a little faster, she would have cleared the automobile, sustained no injury at all. Had she been a little slower, she would have remained in the car and been injured, but certainly she would not have died. And for 37 years, I've said if, 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 if. But that hasn't brought her back from the dead. Her body is still in the cemetery. And if we get on the other side unprepared to meet God, we may say if, but it won't change our destiny. Think of that haunting memory, all of the opportunities I had to do right. And I refused, and I rejected. Not only did he remember, but he recognized. He recognized Lazarus. He'd known him in this life, he knew him in the next life. I've had people to ask, Jim, do you think we'll recognize one another in eternity? And my answer is yes. Oh, but surely that's not true, for if I were to get to heaven and some of my loved ones missed it, I would know it. Well, friends, we're either going to recognize one another or we won't. And the view of no recognition presents more problems than the view of recognition. Because you get into the next life, there you are in heaven, you look around, you recognize no one. So as far as you're concerned, you're the only one who made it. Well, will you have the ability to recognize yourself? I can recognize Dabney Phillips and not see him. Oh, surely not. Yeah, I can. Just let him stand behind a screen and speak. I know who it is. I recognize his voice, and I'm using that as an illustration. I can recognize him in this life without seeing his physical form. And I maintain if you can do it here without seeing one's physical form, then you can recognize one another in the next life without seeing the physical form or when the form is changed. He knew Lazarus here. He knew him on the other side. If you have someone who left this world without a Savior, that someone never wants to see you again. As a matter of fact, the individual is praying that you will not join him there. My mother was killed in 1941, as I've just indicated. If she died lost, I never want to lay eyes on her again. A friend of mine was in charge of a funeral service for an atheist. I'm not quite sure what to call a service for an atheist. A town wag saw a dead atheist and he said he's all dressed up with nowhere to go. He meant from the atheist's perspective. At any rate, they had a service for him, going away service or something. And his family walked by and took the last look at his body. And his daughter 
just threw herself across his body and said, Oh, Daddy, Daddy, I'll meet you out there someday. None of us would think of criticizing her. She was eaten up with grief. Perhaps she didn't even understand the import of her language. But if you were to interpret it literally, she meant, Dad, I'll meet you in hell. And my friend said, when I screwed the lid down on him, it was the last time I wanted to see him. Wouldn't it be horrible to meet mother or father or son or daughter or husband or wife or uncle or aunt in hell? Why would I add to the affliction of both? And if you've lost anyone who was not ready to meet the Lord, believe you me, that person doesn't want to see you and you don't want to see that person either. In hell, it's going to be worse for some people than others. I state just plainly that I believe in degrees of punishment. I believe that for two reasons. The first is philosophical. And that's not enough unless I can back it with Bible. Criminal jurisprudence recognizes degrees in guilt. A man who commits a crime of passion is dealt with far less severely than one who commits a crime of premeditation. If a fellow flies off the handle and in a fit of anger kills another, he is not punished as severely as the one who coolly, calculatingly, and deliberately plans to take the life of his fellow. The latter is a premeditated murder. The former is a killing of passion. And as our courts recognize degrees in guilt and thus the necessity for degrees in punishment, it is my opinion thus far that God operates in a similar way. But I can move from that, I think, to faith because I believe the Bible supports it. According to Matthew 11, 20 to 24, Jesus said, In the day of judgment it will be more tolerable for Tyre, Sidon, and Sodom than for Chorazin, Bethsaida, and Capernaum. Into those latter three cities our Lord went. He taught them. He was present. They had every opportunity under the sun, but they rejected Him, and they rejected His message. The Lord said that Tyre, Sidon, and Sodom did not have the opportunity of the three cities contemporary with Himself, and thus they would be dealt with less severely or more tolerably than those first century communities. Opportunity plus ability equals responsibility. Little opportunity, little ability, little responsibility. Much opportunity, much ability, great responsibility. According to Luke 12, 47, 48, Jesus said that the servant who knew to do his Lord's will and did it not was beaten with many stripes. And the servant who did not know to do his Lord's will and committed things worthy of stripes, was beaten with few stripes. Again, much opportunity, more severe punishment. Less opportunity, less severe punishment. In Donnie's poem on the Inferno, he divided hell into ten parts. In the inner circle was the most intense punishment. In the second circle, it was bad, but not quite as bad as in the first. In the third, it was severe, but not quite as intense as in the second and on the way out to the ten. Now, I don't know where he got his ten circles but I know where he got the concept for degrees of punishment. And that came from the Bible. If I had to pick a place from which to depart this world unprepared to meet Jesus, it wouldn't be the United States. I'd rather die as an African savage who never saw the inside of the New Testament as to die as a citizen of Montgomery without accepting Jesus Christ as Savior. I'd rather die as an Aborigine in the Australian outback who never heard a gospel sermon as to die as a citizen of the United States unprepared to meet Jesus. We have a Bible. It's written in our own language. We have these Bibles in our homes. We're living something like 65 to 70 years. We have every opportunity under the sun. If you die lost, who's to blame? Who's to blame? We cannot plead ignorance. We know if we don't know, we have the capacity to know. We simply need to decide what's first. We need to get a, a line of our values and decide what's number one and number two and number three and number four. Too many of us are majoring in unimportant matters and we're letting the most important matters in the world glide by. Just don't want to take the most important. Let me see if I can illustrate this to you. And I don't want to be mean or unkind to anyone. We had a man get up and walk out after I'd spoken five minutes. Why? Why? Because this is negative? Because it's too horrible to think about. Why? Why in the world would anyone, upon hearing this just for a few minutes, get up and leave? Now, of course, he might be sick. I grant that possibility. But why, if the man is healthy and he's not sick, just get up and walk out? Is it a refusal to think about it? 
Do you know a lot of us don't even want to think about dying? We don't want to think about judgment. We don't want to think about eternity because if we refuse to think, then we can leave this world in sin and Satan will have had his way. Boy, if there's anything under God's heaven we need to think about, it's salvation and it's eternity. We're not here long. And we're going into this next life. Friends, we'll get the most severe punishment God can mete out. To whom much is given, much is required. And we have received much, much. And finally, hell will be a spot of divided families. Families will be divided on the other side. It's conceivable that you could go to heaven. And every member of your family go to hell. It's conceivable that you could go to hell and every member of your family could go to heaven. We're not going to be judged as families. We're going to be judged as individuals. Families will be divided on the other side. I know you wouldn't think that a sweet young thing like me had been married to the same woman for 27 years, but I have. And Marilyn and I have had a lot of separations. I feel like she's surely been home while I was on the road. Uh, maybe seven or eight of those 27 years. She's had to stay while I've gone. It's a whole lot harder to stay than it is to go. You're looking at the same old house, looking at the same old walls, taking care of those three wild ones of ours. And you know, in all of that period of time, she has never once complained about my being away to preach. I mean, not one time. She hasn't even come close to complaining if I was going to be gone to preach. I have a good woman. She's an unusual person. But I said that to say this, even though she's never complained, I backed out that driveway a number of times when I knew she was weeping in the front room. I don't like to be away from her. I don't like to be away from the children. I enjoy preaching, but separations I despise. But what would be far worse is for us to stand before God on the day of judgment and I'd see my beloved go in one direction as I would go in another. There are going to be mothers and dads go to heaven, sons and daughters go to hell. There's going to be a mother and a daughter go to heaven and a dad and a son go to hell. There's going to be a son and a mother go to heaven. There's going to be a daughter and a father go to hell. And you can work out all sorts of combinations. Hell is a place of divided families. I was about 30, preaching in a football stadium in northern Arkansas, and one night after service, a lady came up to me who was about my age, and she said, I want you to talk to my daddy about his soul. I said, all right. Uh, what is he religiously? I don't know. Well, how does he feel about us? I don't know. How does he feel about the preaching? I don't know. The woman had never married. She'd been with her daddy ever since she'd had a being in the world. She'd been a Christian half that time and had never said one word to that man about his soul. I said, ma'am, I'll be out there tomorrow afternoon to talk to him, but don't expect me to get him by the nap of the neck and the seat of the britches and throw him into the water and baptize him. I was visibly perturbed. Can you imagine a daughter living under the same roof with her daddy for 30 years and not one time discussing with him the matter of salvation. A friend of mine in the North Arkansas church was talking to one of the members of the congregation and he said, I don't know why I can't convert my wife. He's talking to the wrong fella because my buddy told him. He said, it's you. You put anything almost ahead of the kingdom of God. You're not what you ought to be. If you'd be serving the Lord, she'd come on and do the Lord's will too. I lived in a South Arkansas community four years. We had a woman there who was a nurse and a, quote, member of the church, if you use the expression loosely. I visited the hospital every week, and I'd talk to her and, and try to get her to, you know, to make some semblance of being a Christian. And she would attend maybe once every five or six weeks, and that was about the end of it. And one day we were visiting in the hospital, and she said, I don't know why in the world my husband isn't a Christian. I almost fainted. I couldn't understand. Why do I make a statement like that? I didn't have the grit to tell her. But it was that sorry example living under the same roof with him. That was it. I've been to the man's home. I've talked to him about the Christ. I've told him the story of the crucifixion and the resurrection. I've seen those tears course down his cheeks. I'd get him right up to the brink of his obedience. But because she was not living the Christian life, he would not surrender. He is a loyal child of God tonight. But he never did turn to the Lord until she straightened up her own life. And now both of them are serving the Lord. 
But she had to make a change. Some of you ladies, God bless you, you're doing the best you know how. Spiritually speaking, you've had to be a mother and a daddy to your children. You've taught them how to pray. You've taught them the Word of God. You've carried them to church services. Your husband's been like a millstone around your neck. And all I can say is, just keep on keeping on. God will bless you. God will honor you. And because of your efforts, those little ones will make it to heaven. But after having said that, I'm convinced there are some who do not want their mates converting. Oh, dear Lord, to help Jack to become a Christian. That's what we're saying with our lips. What are we saying down here in our heart of hearts? Oh, no, God, don't touch him. Leave him alone. Why, if Jack were a Christian, if he were a child of God, I'd have to get out of my lethargy and out of my apathy. I'd have to begin to serve you. No, Lord, you just leave him alone. Oh, but I hear, if I get to heaven and my maid isn't there or my children aren't there, I won't be able to stand it. How are you taking it now? How are you taking it now? Friends, do you think if we're unconcerned about the lost here that we'll get to heaven and then all at once be concerned about them over there? Why, yes. Here in Luke 16, the rich man was concerned about his five lost brothers. Oh, but he wasn't in heaven. He was in hell. If we get to heaven, we're going to have to be concerned about the lost here. I don't want everybody to be saved. I don't want anybody lost. But I sure want my own flesh and blood to go to heaven. I want Marilyn to get there. I want Cindy, Jimmy, and Mike to get there. Some of us say, well, I can't talk to my loved ones about Jesus. If we can't talk to our loved ones about Christ, pray tell me with whom can we talk? Who can we talk? Why can't I talk to Marilyn about the Savior? Why can't I talk to my three children about my Master and my Lord? He means more to me than anyone else. Why are we bashful? Why are we ashamed to tell someone else about it, particularly our own families? Oh, but I just couldn't stand it in eternity without my loved ones. I raise the question again, how are you able to stand it now? My first meeting was held at home, little community where I grew up. Do you know why I went back? One of the main reasons was to get my guardian, my uncle, the fellow who had seen after me for six years after my mother was killed, and there's things to a daddy I had. And I wanted to get him. And let me tell you something, before that meeting ended, he was gotten. Well, he knew the gospel as well, if not better than I did. But you see, when the little kid that had grown up at his feet began to put the claims of the Lord to him, he couldn't stand it anymore. And he became a child of God. And I'm surely glad. He's up in his 70s now and had several heart attacks and he could go at any time. But he's ready to go. I was able to get him. Got some of my cousins. Went back the next year, and by the grace of God was able to reach a lot of the boys with whom I had grown up. Oh, my friends, please remember that all of our family are not gonna make it to heaven unless they're all Christian. God is no respecter of persons. He's not gonna save you, and he's not gonna save them because your name or their name happens to be Brown or Smith or Jones or Johnson or Allen. No, they're going to have to be Christians, and we need to share the message with them. Let's try to take our loved ones to glory, and let's try to take as many others as we can. Charity begins at home. Let's start there and work with them. In Hebrews 10, I beg your pardon, Matthew 10, 28, Jesus said, Fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul but rather fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Our Lord said, don't be afraid of a man who can just kill you. But he said, you need to fear God because he can destroy soul and body in hell. Let's put the Lord first. Let's try to serve him. I don't know this, but I have a sneaking suspicion it's true that the burden of the cross must have been a little lighter for the Savior when he realized that not only he was saving us from our sin, but he was saving us from everlasting destruction. He did that in order that we might be redeemed and we might be saved from eternal hell. And just think of people being swept over the precipice into eternity without God. And then think of the cross sort of putting away and stopping that flow. And tonight if you'll turn to Christ and him crucified, you can be saved. And if you'll continue to serve him all the days of your life, you can stay saved. 
No one has to be lost. I wish you'd listen to me. I plead with you to flee from the wrath which is to come. And I beg you to make your peace with God by obeying Him. Acts 2.38, listen to it. Repent. That's where you yield your will to His will. And be baptized. That's immersion. In the name of Jesus Christ, by His authority, for remission of sins, self-explanatory, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Tonight, if you'll really trust that risen Savior, and if you'll turn away from every sin, yield your will to His will, be immersed in His name, you can leave here with forgiveness of sins, and you can leave here filled with the Holy Spirit and have the hope of eternal life. If you're an erring brother or sister, according to Acts 8.22, you need to repent and pray if perhaps the thought of thine heart may be forgiven thee. Whoever you are, please, don't let this opportunity pass. You may be nearer the kingdom right now than you've ever been. And we're going to be singing in just a minute the hymn, Just As I Am. If you want to come to the front for restoration, for prayer, if you want to come for baptism, make your way to the front. There are people sitting down here, but we'll ask them to move. And if we have to fill two rows, that'll just be fine. Anything we can do to help you. If you want to set up a counseling appointment with some of these good people, you want to study further, you want to place membership with the church, you want to come for baptism, for prayer, whatever your need is, God help you to do it. And I beg all of us, let's get serious about it and strive to be Christians. Don't let anyone or anything keep you from coming tonight. Won't you please do it while together we stand and sing. Come right now, please. Just as I am without one plea but that thy blood was shed for me and that thou bidst me come to several to answer the invitation tonight and my with an audience this size there are others who ought to come and friend surely you haven't understood the significance of what I've been discussing if you're lost and know it there isn't any need and you're staying there and if you'd come and surrender and obey the Lord you could leave here a child of God and even if you don't know what to do to be saved if you'll come to the front we'll read the scripture to you and try to show you exactly what you need to do to be saved. And here's a brother coming right now even. God bless him. The others who want to come, just make your way to the front while this talk is taking place. Solomon said a long time ago, I saw the wicked buried who had come and gone from the place of the holy. And translated into modern day parlance, I saw people leave this world unprepared who attended church services with a degree of regularity. We're glad to have you tonight. Appreciate you coming. But just the fact that you're here is not sufficient for your salvation. You need to yield. Well, your feet are made out of clay just like mine. 
And you're going to have to surrender to the Lord just like I did. You need to believe and be baptized just like I did. That's what Jesus said. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He didn't say he that believeth and is not baptized shall be saved. It's he who believes and is. And I urge you, if you trust the Lord and you haven't taken this, this last step to bring you into the kingdom of God, then do it tonight and leave here as one of his disciples. I'm just begging you to do it for your own sake and for your Lord's sake. Let's sing whatever we like here, maybe three more stanzas. Let's sing at least three more stanzas of this hymn, and you rethink it and come, won't you please? Just as I am poor wretched blind, We sing two stanzas of Oh, Why Not Tonight. What number is that, Don? 686. I want us to sing the first and the last stanza of Oh, Why Not Tonight. We've had a number of others to respond, and maybe you're waiting, and it's now you're about ready to do the Lord's will. This invitation is open to male and female, to Jew and Gentile, to black and white, to whoever you are. If you need the Lord, he loves you. And he invites you. He says, come unto me, and I will give you rest. I hope you'll listen. I hope you'll rethink it. You may be as close to Christ right now as you've ever been. Why not come all the way? First and the last of Oh, Why Not Tonight. Oh, do not let the word depart. And close thine eyes against the light. No. 